It is a huge, huge, unbelievable honor to be not only podcast interviewing Mark Fleming, hey, Howard. but this guy is a cult legend on Dentaltown, oh. where, I mean, you got 10,000 posts on Dentaltown, but in, if you look at Dentaltown, so many signatures say, friend of Flem. How did, where, where, where did that whole friend of Flem start? It, it started, gosh, I think it was like 2004, we were, we were at some... Um, Workshop. It was uh, myself, Darren Greenhall, uh, Rich Rosenblatt, and it was on an early Cyric thing. And uh, uh, I actually hadn't met uh, Darren Greenhall at that time. And he came up and he started bowing to me and he just said, you know, I would like to be a friend of Phlegm. And then people <laughs> took off, you know, Todd Ehrlich made this gif that played in his signature and people just started writing it and then the next thing i knew it had a you know a, a life of its own and and i should have marketed it like you marketed dental town i could have been retired maybe you could have your own yeah. website for yeah Flem. Let, let me uh, read your bio okay mark j fleming dds is a 1970 graduate of the ohio state university you always have to say the the well in front of i tell ohio you it was state. so long ago it was before it was the ohio are you state. serious seriously are uh, you and kidding? i'll tell you a story how that came okay, about okay but, tell so. well so you know on monday night football they used to uh go through the people on the sidelines and start introducing them right yeah. you know this and then one time it was I always remember Otis Sistrunk from the Oakland Raiders Otis Sistrunk University of Mars you know he did he, <laughs> he would start goofing so they had this it was like an <laughs> offensive tackle or somebody and this guy came on and said you know Joe Blow the Ohio State University and that's actually how things started so I graduated well before that I mean <laughs> from college people said where'd you go to college my freshman year I said I went to Indiana State BB do you know what BB stands for? Before Bird. That's how old I am, oh, okay. Howard. So, I before mean, Larry before Bird. Yeah, you got it. The Ohio State University College of Dentistry, Dr. Fleming has spoken to several international groups on CIRAC technology and has served on the board of an international academy, which furthered the understanding and use of computerized technologies and machinable restorative materials in dentistry. He serves as a consultant to a variety of dental manufacturers, helping in product evaluation and design. Dr. Fleming has been a CIRAC user since 2001. Dan, was that CIRAC 1? Uh, no, it was actually just the beginning of 3. It was 3 and 2? Okay, oh, that's right. I got it on 87. Okay. Um, a beta tester for the CIRAC software since 2004. He is a faculty member in the CAD-CAM dentistry department at Spear. Dr. Fleming also serves as faculty on CIRACDoctors.com, the largest online CIRAC training in the world. He is a basic and advanced trainer for Patterson Dental for CIRAC Technology and editor for CIRACDoctors.com, the magazine. So CIRAC Doctors actually mails a magazine? Yeah, uh, we do it quarterly. We send it out to 60,000 people. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, uh, we were charged with this thing, and I had never done anything like this in my life. And uh, I think uh, we are, like, in our eighth or ninth year now and uh it it's really uh we have some great cases that we do with the technology and and comb beam and integration with uh, implants and and all sorts of things and uh uh it, it it's one of my duties at at spear education you know when uh you've been on dental town since the uh, you know by the way yeah where it says 2001 that's because we didn't program the date thing in there until exactly. 2001 it started yeah. in 1998 but most of the people <laughs> i know at 2001 that's just because that's when we programmed that little field exactly, and there was no yeah. way to back populate yeah dennis murphy i got to get this in dennis murphy who's still in cincinnati a good friend of mine that we actually went to high school together said hey you got to check out this website I, I think you'll enjoy it and he he got me on uh dental town well talk about because after yeah i mean you have ten thousand six hundred eighty posts i feel like i know you better than my my mom or my sister <laughs> um but talk, talk us about your journey because you left ohio but you were in florida right so i started and then, started, now, and then yeah. now you're in arizona now we're in arizona so uh basically started out in, in the cincinnati area um you know graduated in 78 so was in Cincinnati from 78 to 93 uh, around that time uh, my wife was visiting Florida a lot because her sister lived down in the Tampa area and was always going down there and and then uh, I, I kiddingly say and just kidding uh, one day she said hey I'm moving to Florida would you like to go along 
Now, uh, I had a, a what I thought to be a, a really nice practice in Cincinnati and was doing well. But, uh, you know, I said, OK, if we're going to do this, this is in this point of life, this is when I want to do this. So, uh, in fact, I got the opportunity to take the Florida boards twice. Uh, but we got down there in, uh, you know, in 93, um, uh, and then things just really took off well. And actually, I, I thought we were going to retire there. I, everything was going uh, along really, really well. But uh, I met this guy, um, uh, I think it was at the second townie meeting, and uh, he and I hit it off really well, and it was Samir Puri, and uh, the, the rest has been history on that standpoint. So I was doing a lot of traveling back and forth between uh, Sarasota and here, because, uh, and at that time, we were, we started off with courses like once every, uh, you know, once in a, a month and a half, and then it got to be once a month, and, you know, I'd, I'd practice until Thursday at noon, jump on a plane, go from Sarasota to Atlanta, Atlanta to here, get up at... You I'm, know, I'm sorry, I thought you said you were in Tampa. No, I was actually, I moved to Sarasota. Oh, the sister was in Tampa. Sister was in Tampa. But you moved to Sarasota. Yeah, because okay. I didn't want to be, you know, it's, with family, it's good to be close, but... yeah. Not that close. And how far is Sarasota from Tampa? Uh, Two hours? An south? hour. Oh, at the most. Hour? Some place is okay. 45 minutes. Okay, so you're in Sarasota, which is getting whacked by a hurricane. Yeah, actually, some kids still live there. I was checking in with them. They're doing fine. But, you know, so it was to the point, you know, there's a saying when you fly Delta, and I was flying Delta a lot, even when you die, you have to go through Atlanta. <laughs> and uh, so the last part I was, you know, I, I was talking to Sam and I said, you know, I may want to maybe cut back a day or whatever. And he goes, well, I got to tell you, we're going to be busier next year. So I, I went back and talked to my lovely wife, Lori, and I said, um, hey, how would you like to go on an adventure? And she says, what's that mean? And I said, oh, not much. Sell the practice, sell the house, move to uh, Arizona. And she said, are there any guarantees? And I said, no. Why would there be any guarantees? And she goes, you think it's the right thing? And I said, yeah, I, I really do. So moved out here uh, beginning of 2012. Had a practice for uh, about two and a half years. And then I uh, uh, actually tomorrow is my... Even though I've been coming out here since 2007, helping uh, Samir with courses, uh, tomorrow is my second anniversary with Spear being a full-time uh, employee with Spear Education and Zurich Doctors. Well, congratulations! Thank on you. That. So, so um, some people have um, romantic feelings that you know someday I want to sell my practice and go teach at the school. What was it like going from being? the boss the man you and now you you're... i'm glad you bring that up because two years ago it was the first time in 37 years i had worked for somebody i was always the man you know i was always the person i was always the go-to person it, it's 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 different and and not different in a bad way in some ways different with a good way uh in that not only do we get to bounce ideas off the, the brightest minds in the CERC technology, but also with, with Spear Education. And, and that's been key uh, for me because even at my age, I, I'm, I'm a lifetime learner and I'm always learner. So now I get to sit in on, on courses with, uh, you know, Frank Spear, Greg Kinzer, Gary DeWood, uh, you know, all these great minds. Uh, Great friendships with people like Bob Winter and Kevin Quishan and and Darren Deister. Uh, it, it's just a, a a great think tank, and now we're melding more and more digital with. We like to say the CEREC part is the what. What am I going to do to treat this patient? But there's got to be a why behind it. How am I setting this case up? How am I doing these things? And, and that's where you can have a great foundation with Spear Education. So I, re I really enjoy that standpoint of it. I, I was I was I was almost going to Google. What did CIRAC stand for originally? Boy, you know I don't Cer even know ceramics, and I think at one time it w was economical restorations, something something. I you know I was it, it chairside it, economical restorations, it, but um. It, but I, I wanted to ask you because uh, you and I are older. Yes, it is and we're it, not just so we're clear, Howard. We're not older. Uh, I got this from Glenn Hamp. We're chronologically gifted. <laughs> so I just want to be real clear with, and since we'll be talking about millennials later on. Hey, Ryan, Google what does CEREC stand for? <laughs> chronologically gifted. Yes. Um, 
is is um you know like podcasters are under thirty. Correct. What what is your average Syriac user? Is it an old guy like us? Or is uh, it no, a young I kid think it's or? more and more people. Uh, you know, uh, a, a younger breed. Um, you know, you had geeks like ourselves that when we got into it because we, it was something new. It was something technologically driven. But I can remember for the longest time, I even poopod. You know, uh, having computers. Oh, wait Sarah, a minute, I had to put on my... Sarah was chair-side economical restoration of, of aesthetic, aesthetic ceramics. ceramics. Boy, that's pretty sweet, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Chair side economical restoration yeah. of aesthetic ceramics, but but you guys, um, you've you've sold. I don't know how many you've sold. It's got to be over ten thousand in America. Do you know how many? You've sold? Uh, actually, I think it's more than that. I think it may be up to fifteen now. So, of the fifteen thousand, is there a sweet spot in the age? I don't think so. I think you'll find more and more people getting into it because they are uh, they know more about technology. Uh, you know. Uh, and it's another way of doing something, maybe more efficiently, faster, maybe in some ways better, not all the time. But, uh, it, you know, I, you want to have that technology in your office, whether it's digital x-rays, whether it's a, some sort of practice management computers. Because when people walk in, I don't think there's very many people that walk into a dental office now that don't have a cell phone. And it's not one of these things that's strapped to their hip that's going to cause a hip replacement because they're leaning over to the side because it's so daggone big. No, these are minor computers. These things that, you you know, Ryan just looked up here, has more power than the first computer that I had in, in practice in 1984. You know, so we're technologically driven. And the and, the, and yeah. Neil Armstrong. It, it's just amazing what we're doing now, technology-wise. And you have to have that in a dental practice after a certain period of time. Whether and but have it economically driven. It, it has to make economic sense. And so that's the same way with any technology you're putting into your office. It has to make economic sense. Uh, you know, will it, will it help you treat patients better, make economic sense? Can you market it? Uh, it it's just not, hey, there's something out there, I'm going to buy it. Uh, no, it, it, you know, we're all business people. Unless you're doing this for altruistic reasons only, you got to make a living out of this. And usually we have families, they've got to be fed. But not only are we responsible to our families, but we're also responsible to our staff. They're relying on us for a job. You know this as a small business person, that's what drives the economy is not necessarily huge corporations. It's small businesses. So when we make economic decisions, they have to be smart economic decisions. So you're the editor of Syrac yeah. Doctors Magazine. Right. And so uh, for you to be the editor, you're trying to address the um, the things that's most relevant to them. Right. So, so what, what is the most... Uh, so these are Syrac users. Correct. So people get the magazine are, are users. Um, what is the most relevant I think, editorial to that you're... Um, I think I think now, you know, with aesthetic restorations, there's also bread and butter, you know, posterior. I think, uh, you know, Mike DeTola, when he was still with Glidewell before going to Dense Poly Slorona, there, there are things where, what, 74% of Crown and Bridge that came into their lab was one unit posterior and another 14% on top of that was two unit posterior. Well, that's the same when you're doing with CEREC, but you also now are seeing a lot of implant restorations driven with the technology because we can control a lot of things emergence profile having the restoration or actually the implant being set in the position restoratively before we want to do it one of the reasons why i got into CEREC in 2001 was i wanted control i wanted things that fit i was doing a lot of partial coverage i sucked at partial uh, provisionals they would never stay on it was tough to do now I could do everything in one visit and be able to do it well but also I you know maybe some things that I was getting back from laboratories there and what weren't up to what I wanted so when I got into it there was only one person I could blame and that was me and I was okay with that and I wanted to get better with it faster with it take care of more people and and that's why I really embraced the technology Boy, it's amazing. You and I, we would have never guessed when we got out of school that someday oh. we'd see the extinction of the PFM. Uh, PFM, hell, I was using rubber base, the best impression material ever. You got to wait 10 minutes to find out it wasn't right, <laughs> you know, and then take another one, and it smelled and tastes bad. Other than that, it was a great material. Yeah, it, it is pretty tremendous of what we do nowadays. Um, a lot, a lot of, to implants, um, 
A lot of people think um, there seems to be on Dentaltown a huge debate. Do you cement or screw? Um, a lot of people think the cementing is causing a lot of periimplantitis. Are you a cementer or a screwer? It depends. Uh, and the reason why I say that in a perfect world, if you can go screw retain, especially in the posterior area, uh, I'll go uh, screw retain. Now, what that entails, though, is not just the implant restoration itself, but the teeth on either side have to allow for the placement of that without running into the interproximal contacts. But it also then goes back how was the implant placed? Because if the implant is going this direction and you got to come this direction, it ain't going to fly. So that's where also technology can come in. You can go in, guided surgery, have the implant placed restoratively, how you know you're going to restore it beforehand, and then you can be more uh, screw retained. In the anterior area, because of the way implants are uh, placed, maybe the screw hole is in an aesthetic area, so now we'll break that apart. The nice thing with the CEREC technology, though, once again, is control. I can place those margins of my abutment right at tissue level, and therefore, I'm not worried about a deep margin where I have to say, did I really get all that cement cleaned out of there? The cement is right at the gingival cuff because I controlled that and how I created that that abutment, you know, for myself and then have the crown on top of it. So I'm not dissing cement sepsis. It is a problem. But if I can place my margins where I can readily clean them and have ways that I can clean them, I'm not as concerned about it going with a cement retained um, implant restoration. When you said sometimes the implant's going like this and sometimes going yeah. like this, which one did Jay Resnick place? Uh, Jay's <laughs> pretty pretty good, but you got to admit, Jay uh, <laughs> uh, puts things together and he does things guided. So that's uh, you know that's that's one of the great things about that. That's a, that's another um, that's another huge controversy on Dental Town um, is guided surgery overkill. Is that all necessary? Um, what, what what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are you know I, I want what's ever going to be the best for me or my patients and what's going to be the most predictable what's going to give me the most predictable outcome if you can show me and you and not just by confidence but if you can show me that you can do this without being guided and you can show me your cases and i mean all your cases and do that for maybe whatever is simple and i know after being on this god's green earth all these years there ain't nothing simple about anything especially drilling into somebody's head i may <laughs> allow you to do that but i i am more or less lines i want that implant placed guide it because then i know restoratively it's going to be in the correct place and once again the control aspect of being able to control where everything's going and then with occlusion and positioning and everything else i'm, I'm going to lean more towards the guided so when you got into CIRAC, CIRAC was pretty much all restorations and now yes. the implants later so right now when you're building your magazine or or it was on sericdoctors.com website or the magazine what what percent is the the if you looked at the 15,000 Sarek doctors, what percent of them are placing implants? You know, that's, is, it, is this a new thing? Is it's, it? And it's not new. I think when you find people that want to have, once again, back to the control, then they may be not getting what they want from surgeons. So they they invest, uh, you know, in more and more education to place these uh, implants. There's a lot of talk on on CERICDoctors.com about guided implant uh, uh, surgery and, and, and placing implants and what may be the best implant placement. There, there's, there's a lot of good systems out there. I just think that you use them correctly you use them predictably, you have the, your end goal in mind, and usually, uh, not usually, it, it should be what's going to be the best for the patient. And and if you go through these years, I mean, you know, after being in private practice for 37 years, if you do what's best for the patient, everything else takes care of itself. And, and the best is a moving target because um, exactly. and I'm it changes. so all mine are gold. I have seven restorations, seven for seven are gold. Um, that was the best at the exactly. time. Exactly. Um, because at the time, you couldn't uh, guarantee that PFMs wouldn't shatter. But, but anyway, so I want to ask you, um, 
So we're when when you're talking on the website and the magazine, talk about blocks. I mean, um, there's I, been a big evolution of blocks. Big. I mean, for, for the, 15 years. Yeah, for the longest time, it just seemed like the software was getting improvement, but no in, no, no changes in the blocks. Now it's like everybody's coming out with a block, and there's so many different uh, properties that they're proposing, and and so it's like you have a lot of choices, which is good. I mean, th you have your aesthetic choices, you got your anterior aesthetics that you can be going with. Well, will you go through all those? Well, I, I I'll do my best. Uh, you know, once again, this is one man's opinion, so uh, one I'm hell not, of a man's opinion. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, in the anterior area, I'm, uh, I start out with the Vita products that are the Thelospathic porcelain, but you also have, uh, uh, you know, Ivacar has their uh, uh, Empress CAD. We used to nickname it Empress on a Stick, uh, you know, because Empress was such a, a aesthetic restoration. So I'll use a lot of those uh, type of uh, restorations in the anterior personally. A lot of people like Emacs uh, for strength in the anterior, and they recently came out with a medium translucency block. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, my cohorts use that. I'm, I'm more along the lines of, of the Vita and the Ivaclar Empress. As I'm starting for anterior, to, for anterior, and is I'm, that anterior just for pretty girls? I mean, like no, I was a, it was you a know, 54 year old bald man like me. Would you still? I still do it. You wouldn't call that an aesthetic health compromise? No, I, I think it's it's it, what how it's is strong enough. It's strong enough, and how is it melding in with the rest of the teeth in the mouth? Isn't, and what if he was isn't white and bright and had a liver spot on his head? And and I can match the rest of their teeth, and I can do it predictably. I can. I'm really good so with you, the Vita. So, so I guess what I'm saying aesthetic. is, so you're not saying on an anterior incisor that Vita Feldspathic or Ivaclar Empress is an aesthetic health compromise. No, it's you're, not. It's no, not a compromise. Not a, it's not a compromise because because there's a lot of things we do in dentistry that's an aesthetic health compromise. I mean, there's a lot of most like on all molars. An amalgam would always last longer than a composite. I don't care what anybody says. You don't care what everybody says? Well, the, the research is so clear. I mean, you go to the Army where they have their data and they show that, okay, when we put these in troops, they last 38 years. Uh huh. And then you look at all these university studies on composites, it's all 7 to 14. And then I just want to know who were those who placed the composite. Okay, okay, but, okay, that's true, but... Techniques this is what is known as a discussion, not yeah. an argument. But, but just so we're clear. But you have to factor in technique sensitive. A exactly, and so, that's and it's and always that's what you were saying about the um, the guided surgery. Exactly, and and look, we even say this about Sarek because people will say, you know, well, one of the things that they don't want to get involved with this technology because they've seen an ugly Sarek. You know, and truthfully, Howard, I've probably done a few of those in my time, you know, over 15 to 17 years. But I'll also then ask the question, have you ever seen an ugly composite? Have you ever seen an ugly amalgam? Have you ever seen an ugly PFM? Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's the operator. You know, it's not the arrow. It's the person behind with the bow that makes things go. It's the same way in dentistry. So... If I can do things predictably with a certain material, utilizing a certain technology, and, and I do it better for me, and I'm doing a great service for my patients, I can sleep at night. That's that's what I wanna say, to get across. So if I can do a great composite, take my time, make sure I have isolation, use, use great uh, uh, bonding materials, learn from great teachers of bonding like John Kanka who's always on on Dental Town and and others I you know I feel confident in the service that I'm I'm giving my patients so uh, that's that's really the point that I'm getting at I, I don't place composites uh, and I still am placing a composite and I'm getting ready to replace a composite on my wife after 15 years uh, you know now that I put that composite, I place that knowing that there is a life expectancy. Nothing's forever, you know, not even but diamonds. Know, but you know what concerns me the most about the amalgam composite debate is um, in the last four months, Ryan and I have lectured in Tokyo, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, South Africa, Soweto, London, Paris, France. When you, when you go to like Africa, and I've been in so many dental offices in Africa or Central America. The dentist has a lawn chair 
and he's and the patient spits in a pickle bucket and there's no assistant and there's no high speed suction and they're on dental town reading that this is better and they're it's, trying and I, I okay can I can I yeah. describe one posterior composite I saw live in Tanzania drills the hole drills the hole every couple of minutes she sits up and spits in this bucket he finally puts on the etch while the etch is on there she swishes with water spits <laughs> he puts on the bonding agent cures then she wrenches spits, spits. then i mean when the whole thing was done i was just saying i didn't know whether i should laugh or cry right and, and if that would have been an amalgam it whole damn thing would have worked and and so what i'm gonna right do, right exactly because that's the circumstances and those are the materials that you're working with and the knowledge to work with them. So would I be uh, placing posterior composites without some sort of isolation? No. If I'm forced with that, yeah. I use a material that's going to be able to be placed and withstand what I'm dealing with at that time. I don't. Unfortunately, I'm living in a great country where I have, you know, Tommy Hirsch comes up with something like a, a, a nice light, light and, which allows me to predictably do materials. I have, you know, people like, you know, uh, John Kenka, as I mentioned before, Berlotti, Fuziyama, who, who play a great And we just place. lost one the other day out in Lacey. Oh, really? Out in Lacey. Yeah. He was so, driving himself to a hospital. Oh, my gosh. didn't make it. So you have pioneers like this who have developed products and, and just uh, the theory behind these products that allow at least U.S. dentist or North American dentist or whomever, even in Scandinavia, I mean, great clinicians across the world to be able to place different materials more predictably and be a, a better service for the patient. I want, I want to ask you a, a technical question. Uh, that um, they talk a lot on Dental Town. Okay. They emailed. On. Oh no, you were finishing your blocks first. Oh, okay. Uh, so you, in the, in the felt path, the yeah, uh, so, is not an aesthetic health compromise for interiors. So in now let's go bicuspids and molars. Uh, bicuspids can either go with what I just mentioned, or I start going into Emacs. Okay. And and I I, I bond Emacs. I, I know it can be cemented at a certain thickness and whatever, but if I'm going, for, the reason why I'm placing Emacs is for strength, and therefore you get your most strength from bonding. Therefore, guess what I do? Bond. That, that's as simple as that. Now I have choices, uh, let's say, mainly on second molars, uh, that if, if I can't get a good bonding for whatever reason, whether prep design or something's going on, I'll, I'll think zirconia. And now with the new Speedfire with, uh, you know, Dense by Serona, they've taken that last objection away. So I can do everything chair side now. But it, but it sounds like the, the um, I mean, zirconia is exploding. Would you say that? Yeah. And would you say it's exploding because it's cementable and there's yes. no bonding? Yes. It's, it's easier. It's just easier. It's easier for a lot of people. I've bonded since the 90s. So bonding for me isn't that difficult as long as I have my system down with the materials that I have. So whereas maybe somebody getting out of school right now isn't so confident in their bonding skills or knows enough about materials or whatever, maybe they feel more comfortable in cementing and how, restorations. what are you bonding Emacs with? Uh, I, there are three materials because of the way I bond things that, uh, that I'm very comfortable in bonding with. One is uh, Surpass. Uh, surpass and an anchor from uh, apex dental materials that was surpass and anchor uh, yeah uh, surpass is the bonding material anchor is the looting uh, portion of that and then and that's john kinkis company uh, yeah apex, apex dental. dental is that, is that apex that? dental materials dot com that's john kinka yeah and then uh, i'll do scotch bond universal and rely x ultimate from 3m and xtr and um nx3 from kerr I'm not saying that there aren't other okay, materials out there. 3M was Scotch Bond what? Scotch Bond Universal and Reliax Ultimate. Scotch Bond Universal yes. and Reliax Ultimate. Because everything, everything, including several children at 3M, are named Reliax. So, um, <laughs> um, my, my job is to estimate questions. Um, you just said, You're doing a good job. I want to congratulate you sure, on that. He said, uh, <laughs> "Surpass was bonding and anchor was looting." Explain the yeah. difference between bonding and looting. Well, bonding, what what's going to be is the you know the etching material or the conditioning material, then the primer, and then the bonding agent. Uh, for some people, call the looting part cement. 
bondable cement. I think there's confusion though when you use when you know when you and I got out of school, cement was zinc phosphate. That was cement, and then bonding was. I don't even remember the first bonding material that I first, I think it was uh, from Bisco. I think it was uh, all bond to and whatever else they were, uh, they're looting they had in that system. Uh, you know, that, that was true fourth generation. You know, I think of generations, I mean, I'm getting that point in my life, you know, we could be on the 14th generation. You know, I'm looking at, you know, Star Trek to the next generation. What, what you know, we got so many generations, I don't even know what the heck's going on anymore. But that, that's, that's, that's uh, so I, the looting part, you know, the thing that you squirt in the crown and put it on is what I consider looting. The thing that you put on the tooth is the bonding agent portion. So that's Surpass, XTR, and the Scotch Bond Universal. Is that, is that of those three, what's your go-to? Uh, all three. And the all reason three. why, because, because of the position that I'm in nowadays, uh, in the education point, I want to be able to refer to different bonding materials. So I, I've used, you know, I don't necessarily have a favorite. You know, I may be leaning more towards Scotch Bond Universal right now, uh, but you know, would I have any difficulty with any of these three? No. I do have a favorite though. Um, I think the fries at Burger King are better than McDonald's. Because when you're eating fries at Burger King, you always get a surprise at the end. Maybe an onion ring, half a tater tot. Yeah, you know. You know, they just don't have that. Does that speak to quality control, though? Don't you ever <laughs> begin to wonder about that then? I think the Cracker Jacks box uh, planted yeah, that idea. You know, you say hand. fries. Now living out here, I think, you know, supermarkets. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, um, so um, a lot, a lot of what dental, one of the biggest problems Dental Town solved is with the internet, no one has to be alone. So a lot, exactly. of time, a lot of times we're driving down the street thinking, you know, I, I really just want to know what everyone else is using. So on, on a first molar, because um, when you're talking about doing a crown, the tooth most likely to be crowned as a first molar, to tooth most likely to be root canal, tooth most likely to be missing. I mean, the first molar, we got at six. The second molar, we got at 12. The difference between home care at age six and 12 is obviously huge. Um, Ryan didn't brush his teeth till he was 21. Uh, so only his 21 year molars are doing good right That's now. That's good. But um, so well, on, you're that, making progress. on that six year, on that six-year molar, what percent of that right now do you think is being um, used uh, Emax versus zirconium? For whom? A first molar. For whom? For me? For you? For no, the, the market. The market. The market. Brand. That's a really good question. Um, if because you look five at five years ago, it'd have been all Emax. Yeah. If you, have yeah. I mean, when did zirconia really come? I think, when did it really make I it think stay? the you know from what I've seen is is when you know Glidewell the largest lab in the US uh, started coming out with their Bruxer. I mean, you know, uh, a lab you that I hear? No, I don't. I know a lab that I I use a lot uh, you know is Sean uh, with Keating, Sean Keating's lab. Uh, you know, uh, we were doing a lot of PFMs and and whatever. Um, what is this? <laughs> What is this? <laughs> this? This is the breakfast of champions. Cookie crisp. Yeah, this is great. I mean, this is this is why six year molars look the way they do, and we have to restore them. Uh, uh, this is great. Okay. So so, but but I, I guess we're asking: I, I, is, is zirconia ad, um, um, accelerating towards the market share? Of yeah, first you know, molar? It, it, is, is I, I think going it, down. Is it a tie? Is I, it, I think you're finding that more and more zirconia. More it, more. It's funny, Howard, and and we look at something like this you start to say okay what's more aesthetic and you've already touched on this when when we had our teeth restored it was gold yeah. now when we had our teeth restored with gold what was the prettiest restoration gold, gold. We, we we as dental geeks would say oh my god look at look at that gold restoration that, that's incredibly beautiful i challenge you to go out on the street right now and find me 15 people who think the gold is the most beautiful restoration in the world however i would also challenge you to go to pubmed and help me understand how aesthetics creates any clinical increase and in longevity of any restoration place in the mouth it's about materials and and always you know aesthetics plays a part for different people some people that they'll look in their own mouth, they'll say, you know, hey, it's white, it's good. 
some people will say, well, you know, there's a little tinge of this. Usually with those people, I say, you know, if somebody can see that, they're standing way too close. You know, nobody should see that. But anyway, so aesthetics is, is in the eye of the beholder, but the longevity and the physical portion of the restoration, those you can be more predictable about. So, you know, predictability, Emacs is good, Zirconia is good, depends what floats your boat. And I'll tell you what, what floats, what grinds my gears, uh, you know, those women decorate their entire body with gold. They'll come in with seven beads of gold in their ear, a gold pin in their nose, gold in their belly button, toes, I mean, the whole body. And then I suggest a gold crown, crown? on number on a second Max Story Moore because there's hardly any clearance. And they look at me like I'm a freak. You know, my wife, <laughs> my wife it had, might even be sleeved with ta an arm tattoo. And my, I'm the freak. My wife has gold inlays on her third molars, so I I believe in gold. Those were a bear to see, but they're in there, and they've been in there for many many years. So it's that, a great material. That reminds me, um, did you know I got a hole in one? Go right ahead, sir. I'm ready to drop the mic. This is I got a hole in one, that's why they had to remove my wisdom tooth. Ba-boom, there we have it, ladies that's and gentlemen. Hole. He's here all week, please tip your waiters. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, what do you cementing your zirconium with? If, if you uh, don't want to go through the trouble of bonding and you just uh, want to see Reli Reli-X looting cement. Like I said, everything at 3M is either uh, lava or Reli-X, but Reli-X looting cement. Uh, any resin modified glass on or cement is, is good to uh, seat your... Uh, now Reli-X, uh, you mean vitromere? <laughs> no, actually, that goes back further too, doesn't it? But now you know it is. I remember one Rely time I victim, I'll never forget when my rep came in and I said, "Yeah, I need some more rich vitamin." And she goes, "They don't make vitamin anymore now. It's Rely X. Rely X." Yeah, and I just thought. I know. I've it's, used this for ten years. Who would change the name after ten it, years? It's all about branding. Yeah, it's all about branding. On SeracDoctors.com or your readers, what? What seems that what, what do they want to know more about? I mean, what what problems are they having? Or they want, what? What do they want more information on? Are they using? They want more information on implant restorations. They want to uh, understand what's happening with the new materials that are coming out. Where, where would you use them? What are the advantages of doing something over something else? Uh, what it, you know, predictability on, on materials, uh, how in the aesthetic reason, aesthetic area, what reasons why you may use one material or the other, what reason would you even do aesthetics in the anterior? I think, you know, we, we have a course all dedicated to helping people have a system of doing anterior <laughs> restorations, because I feel with CEREC, you can, can once again control a lot of things and, and people leave that lying, uh, you know, on their plate. It's a great service that you can do with patients uh, with CEREC. You know, CEREC, uh, Serona was in Germany and Ivan Clare was right next door in Liechtenstein. Hey, Liechtenstein. But now they've uh, married Densply. Densply, um, they have blocks. What, what, right. what, are, what are their blocks? Uh, uh, what are their names? Uh, you know, they have a Seltra Duo. Uh, Say it a little slower. Seltra, C-E-L-T-R-A, uh, Duo. Uh, it, it's it's a good block. Uh, a lot of Seltra Duo. Where, where yeah. does that name come from? You know, I, I, I sometimes I think they lock people in a room in the advertising or in the marketing, and then they feed them just enough food till someone creates. What was the craziest new product marketing in your lifetime in dentistry? Because I got uh, mine. I know what mine is. Oh man, I I don't. Mine was remember that when the Germans came out with Promptel Pop. Yes, and I'm telling this German they. Prompt a pop. Yeah. Goes, yeah, you know, prompt fast, and, and it, it looks, looks like, like lollipop. A lollipop. And it's thinking, prompt a pop. Yeah, I thought. Uh, <laughs> do we get a bong hit with this explanation? You, you Can know, we do some mushrooms and you explain that to me again? They. Uh, so where did Celtric do? Okay, because to me it sounds like it was a foreign. It's a. It's a. Well, it was developed country. both by uh, Densply and uh, Vita over uh, in Europe. Okay, so, exactly. So, so yeah, it's definitely yeah. European. So it's so it's, it's European name. It's European name. Uh, a lot of people are using it. It comes in a high translucency and, and low translucency block. Uh, I've seen a lot of work so, done with it. But you said Celtic Dewar is Densply. Yes. But they well, now it's Densply Serona. Densply Serona. But where did the Celtic Duo block? What, what That was a Densply division? Yes, before what, they merged. What division was that in Europe? I, I 
You don't know. Seltrick. No, I, I yeah. Huh. So so that is that their main CAD CAM block Seltrick duo? At the present time. I know they're developing they're taking over the Seric consumables aspect now since they've merged with Serona. Because Serona had their own blocks also. Uh, their Serona blocks. So now really? I know, Yeah, and now they're also those. You know, taking over the the zirconia aspect. So right. the the consumables. It sounds like uh, more and more uh, that the dense ply aspect of dense ply Serona is taking over. Uh, and with, with the, the, the Seltzer Duo, that be more like an EMAC. It's not a zirconium. It, it's more along the lines of an EMAC. Yeah. It's as have, uh, have you been using these? Have you I've tried? used some of it also. And it, what do you think? It's it's good material. Handled well. It's it's a good material. It's a bonded material. Strictly yeah. bonded. No no cementing. And uh, for the a, first molar, what do you think the American market wants? They Percentage wise, cementable or bondable? Uh, probably cementable. Yeah. Uh, because really, realistically, even the inroads that um, uh, digital restorative aspect uh, milling in office, it, it has still yet to break the twenty percent level in the u.s so that means what you got 80 percent of people out there don't have digital in their office therefore they're setting off for zirconia and they're cementing that in the posterior area and do you see uh dense serona is it dense place serona or serona? dense place serona dense place serona do you see dense place serona um, coming out with a um uh, zirconium block well, they've taken over the the Serona aspect, but they're always those companies are always developing. So you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised in in whatever matter of months, matter of year, you're going to see even more uh, uh, materials out there from Densply, could be from Ivaclar, could be from you know. There's other blocks coming out now from Coltine, uh, GC. There's as a word I like to use every once in a while. There's a plethora of manufacturers coming up with more and more blocks, mm -hmm. Howard. So I always wondered this. So l let's assume that there's 15,000 CIRAC okay. users in the United States. I wonder if they have a higher percent of people that are now placing implants than non CIRAC users as a percent. I, this wouldn't surprise me. And the reason why, and I don't, I don't know, but it wouldn't surprise me because these types of dentists are technology driven. Therefore, they would be more likely to invest in comb beam. They would be likely more to invest in a technology that can talk to their restorative platform. They would be more apt to want to do now things with guides. They would want uh, also now what you can even do chair side, you can mill one tooth guides in your office to do guided surgery so you have all these advantages from a technology standpoint so somebody who's technology driven i would suspect would place more implants than say maybe the generalized public i don't want to come off as the old cranky grandpa how you know we always say we you, know, you know it's funny my grandchild is in his fourth year at university of central florida Are my grand is, is 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 the age of your children dude so really keep so when you said two kids in sarasota that was your grandchildren no that was my kids but those your kid, two kids, kids in Sarasota. yeah but, but my, you got grandkids in where at ucf which Man, means you looking, can't finish uh, but UCF. anyway <laughs> yeah yeah, but, uh, yeah so uh you're not so old wow my little taylor's only four and um cherish so, it but it's she's talking time. uh yeah. she's talking a lot better last time she started preschool so she's talking a lot better i used to not understand her well but now when i so she's expressing dinner, herself i can totally hear her say so now you wonder it's terrible or grandpa buy me this <laughs> <laughs> so of those fifteen thousand Syriac users how many of them have um gone into the uh cbct I, i'm not sure but we're finding that more and more on our boards uh people that are investing in it is, in, oh, oh i know i was going with the grandpa thing okay you, you know the, the, the grandpa's always claiming when we walk to school it's uphill both ways through three feet of snow you know we always say it was harder but I'll, I'll tell you this i got my diplomat in the international congress for implantology back in like the early 90s and and fellowship of the mission suit it was a hundred times harder to place an implant in the late 80s and the 90s i mean you'd have a 2d pano and you'd say 
oh my god i have yeah. an inch of bone you'd lay that baby open and it was a knife edge feather exactly you'd with a concavity some way ah, yeah. by the time you smooth it down to where you had something five six seven millimeters wide to sink a four or five millimeter implant you'll you, sometimes you would oh well you god. know even when i first you'd have to have this huge inventory of implants because if you were a good implantologist you didn't know what the hell you were getting into exactly and you didn't have at least a thousand dollars of inventory in your in your central sterilization room you could not be good at implants right because you never knew what you yeah. were getting yourself into and now, nowadays you know what you're getting yourself into with i mean when i got involved with Ceric, it was before Ceric 3d so we were looking at these cut and projection windows and, and you know you were thinking okay the contact was coming here and the margin was clear you know my wife said she was a Ceric widow for the first six months yeah. <laughs> because i stayed over i was working on models i this damn machine was not going to beat me you know i was going to you know conquer it and then you know two years later they came out with 3d and now it made more sense but we still had lines and then new software comes out and and now you're looking at real teeth and new imaging ways from red cam to blue cam to omnicam now and now you're bringing technology together from cbt's to your CIRAC. you're exchanging files between the two to come up with different things uh uh, now we're into jaw tracking. We can uh, do virtual articulators because of CBT with uh, uh, jaw tracking with our CERIC restorations. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. I mean, that's what, other than I don't play golf that well, that's what keeps me in this game. I, I really enjoy the, what's happening in dentistry nowadays from the why to taking care of patients to understanding what to tick to how we can restore these people to get them. You know, people are living longer. You, you and I are two examples of this. So when we get to a certain age, what happens? It's, it's, it's now it's, it's quality of life. How do I want to live the rest of my life? And teeth and the oral area play a huge huge part in this do i want to eat well do i want to go out and socialize how do i want to do this and and there's for me granted a lot of times people think we came up in the golden age of dentistry dude this is the golden age of dentistry because we have so many more things that can help us we have so many great teachers out this that can help us along these lines in different areas of dentistry and we have a great way of getting this out to people before you did dental town how did you know about people you didn't i mean my best friends that i have now i can truly say were because of dental town isn't that cool it, it it was never where i was practicing at the time it's people from all across who i work with nowadays i met on dental town and we owe that all to al gore yeah we do and like and god bless him you know <laughs> you know too bad about the chads but that's you know that's the way the chad fall you know why i don't give any uh something for the chads because um his home state of Tennessee dropped him. Dropped him. Yeah. So, so if you can't win your hey, home state, Arkansas over. dropped him. Who was the president beforehand? So yeah, don't. Yeah. I was in Florida then. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about because in our county we didn't have chads. We circled in an area and no, we were you good. Can't win your home state. Yeah, you it's pretty have, sad. You might have some issues going on. Yeah. Um, so, and that's the politics for today, ladies and gentlemen. No more. <laughs> Oh my God! I know that could be a but whole actually, new podcast. That, the politics is the best thing that ever happened to me because I what we didn't realize is our our um, the podcast started um, two years ago. Uh, my birthday was the 29th. We started the day before my birthday two years ago. So we're kind of two years. And you look at the growth, and it was just slow, slow, slow. But I only my only explanation of why it's gone viral is what they're telling me in emails. Um, they say I can't turn on the radio. It's just going to be politics i don't want to hear any more about any of this shit so i think from here to november i'm virtually getting a monopoly yeah you should of, um dentist commute to work I because was, i can't take it anymore i would start looking at the marketing aspect you can make a killing uh, off of this Howard. hey whenever i walk in the room if they got the news on and it's it's i i, I just leave there yeah, yeah thank god for sports you know what's happening this yeah, weekend exactly. college thank football god, god, god love it sports. yeah there and we you go know what? i gotta say something about sports um me and uh tom matter remember when tom matter and i were having this discussion we were saying why do why do we like sports so much because it seems kind of ir ir illogical but tom said well you know it's a it's a bunch of men trying really hard to achieve a goal and they're all working together 
and it's teamwork and they have a goal and they know the rules and they play by the rules and you know it's it, not to it's like a, about sports it is and it's it's somebody who has decided they want to be the best at what they can be and whether it's individual let's say about golf i i really like watching women's golf because they're not overpowering the ball or whatever but it's a sweet swing you watch it you know it's not somebody just whipping through some it, 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 it's something about just a, a nice swing and and that's the individual aspect but then you get into something like team sports it, it's like you know you were talking about before i heard you uh about a dentist a jack of all trades well in team sports you have individual uh, that are the best in their position and then when you meld those people together then you have the best team to take care of things. That's one of the things I think of what happens at Spear in an interdisciplinary aspect. You have people that are really, really good in different areas of, of dentistry. But if you're able to bring those all together and be able to treat a patient and treat them comprehensively, that's key. I mean, there's nothing better to watching somebody like Steph Curry just rain threes and whatever. But also, there's nothing better than watching somebody drive the lane and, and watching these big men just swat the ball away and saying, not, not in my world, you know? Everybody has their role in this. And, and, and that's, I think sometimes we forget about that in dentistry. There's people that do things really, really well in different areas and with you know, Dental Town, you have different people able to give their opinions along those lines. And what's it end up being? It ends up being the best for the patient. Patient centered. Um, would you agree or disagree with this? Because we've been doing this for, I've been doing it three decades. My, my office is 29 years old. Congrats. And, um, and, but it seems like, you know, now that I've done this for three decades, it seems like it'll go back to three decades ago. It seemed like the dentist who, um, we're obsessed with CE and took like a hundred hours a year after a decade or two it seems like all those practices were at the cream of the crop like I don't know an MAGD who's struggling on Medicaid exactly all the I'm an MAGD diplomat everybody took a hundred hours and you know that was my uh, that was my um, romantic hidden agenda on these um, these um, podcasts is two years ago, I thought to myself, okay, so I'm reading what they're saying on Dental Town. Uh, they're in a small town. They only have one study club. Meets the last Thursday of every month. At the end of the day, they're tired, they're exhausted. They got a kid and a husband at home. They got to drive across town, eat rubber, chicken, rice, pull off, and then it's a lousy speaker. And I thought to myself, on this podcast, the only advantage I got is I can get all the hot dogs like you <laughs> on this show, and she's multitasking on the way to work because I believe... Um, we, we release a show every day. That'd be 365 shows a year. But do you believe that the people who took just 100 hours of listening to other dentists like you, thoughts in their head, that at the end of 10, 20, 30 years, that was the secret to success? You can't help but get better by, by listening to others that, that are on the top of their game. And, and there is now, and we know this, so much information being released now. You, you cannot keep up with it. So there's got to be other ways of doing it. So podcast is a way to do it, doing it online, uh, multitasking, listening in, in your car to catch up with everything that's being released nowadays. I mean, even back in the old days, Gordon Christensen used to say, you know, uh, 50 to maybe 70 percent of the materials that you were using at day one would not be there at, at year five because things were changing over with manufacturers. That was good. Uh, you just scared the bejeebus out of this cat in here, Samir. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's the, uh, you know, that's where the advantage of, of learning from others. And like I said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lifetime learner. There are, there are a lot of well, smart people um, out there to learn maybe from. Maybe she's not familiar with the courses at um, Spear Center. What, well, there's, so uh, it's not just... Serac. No, there's Cirac, there's a great foundation course that they do called Facially Generated Treatment Plan uh, that helps line up what to do. I will almost guarantee you in the United States right now, 95% of the dentists in their private office have at least one set of models on their desk. And here's how that set of models got there. Patient walks in, says, I want A, B, C, or D. The dentist looks at that inside their mouth and says, I don't know how in the hell to treat this. 
Therefore, since I don't know how to treat this, what do I do? I'll take models. So they take the models, the assistant pours them up, they take them, they look at them, and then they put them on their desk, and the models sit there because the dentist doesn't know what to do. Facially generated treatment plan gives you the why of what you're going to be doing. So that's a great course, great occlusion courses, and then of course on our side. What, what are the great occlusion courses? Uh, 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 seminars why demystifying the uh, uh, worn dentition, uh, worn dentition. They have. Uh, uh, treating the worn treating the worn dentition those are some of the great can, can courses I, can I ask you one, one question sure. on, on that course line when I look on Dental Town um, it's coming up on it's, it's almost a 5 million post it seems like it seems like in so many subjects everybody kind of pretty much agrees for the most part at least 80-20 but damn when you go to occlusion yep it's like it's like religious it's the whole, you know it's it's, what, why, it's, it's like the, the the great you know Crusades and everything. Why, else. why is occlusion the most? You know, that's a that's a great question. I, I, even when I first got out, I, I was in practice with a gentleman uh, for four years, and and then even when we split, we were still friends and uh, got involved with occlusion, and and of course now with Spear and and their occlusion courses. I what I'm looking for is for people to be open, to be practical, and something to be repeatable. If you can give me all those things, then uh, I can listen. I think what we do at, at on the Spear campus accomplishes those things. We can do it with, with the CEREC technology, planning things out and, and then executing. We know the why from the facially generated treatment planning and treating a worn dentition. We know what to look out for. I just sat in yesterday morning uh, in, a, in a workshop with Greg Kinzer, and the, and the most important thing that he was pointing out is we see this where when we know the why of it, then we're better able to treat it. It's not just jumping in and placing crowns and doing everything else. Once we know the why, we can predict our efficiency and treating this and knowing how are things going to need to be treated? Will it be long lasting or do we still need to, as my friend John Canariato puts in his signature on Dental Town, place it, protect it, and then pray? You know, there yeah. are some cases like that. But that that's what I look for after all these years of, you know, the this way is the best way or this way is the best way or the we call them the occlusion wars on downtown. Oh, my God. And, and, and also, you and I are old enough. Um, so let's see. So they graduated at 25. So they would have been six years old when this came out. Remember 19 years ago this year when Reader's Digest. Yeah. Sent their one of their most amazing journalists. Yeah. And it's one of the great scientific uh, publications out there. Reader's Digest. Well, I'll tell you this. You know, right now there's no newspapers or magazines uh, that people subscribe to. But back then, every grandma and grandpa oh, had readers' digest, and it was in every dentist waiting room. Uh, yeah. So, the, so they gave the the uh, this um, Eric uh, Eckerbert, uh, Mr. Yeah, Eckerbert, yeah. Um, study models and a full set of X-rays, and sent them to 50 dental offices. How many treatment plans do you think he got? Well, you know. How many did he get? He got 50. He because got 50 different because treatment plans. Here's the rule in dentistry, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I want you to remember this. You put 10 dentists in a room, you'll get 15 different opinions. <laughs> I'm just telling that. you, it just happens. <clears throat> I love that. But I, but I want to ask you, in, in, has that changed since, if Reader's Digest did that same piece of journalism today, I think 19 so, years later? Well, there's different levels, and there's also, unless you have a certain amount of knowledge about something you don't see it and until you see it you can't treat it so knowledge is key that that's the key to this so you're always going to have people with different levels of knowledge it's just the way it is so therefore you're going to have different treatment plans because people have been exposed dentists have been exposed to different ways of taking care of the same problem some person may look at something and say that requires an amalgam someone say yes you could do an amalgam but you could do a, a direct composite here someone may say yeah a direct composite or but maybe i want to do an indirect here all those are worthwhile treatments i think you find out the key is is not so much what are the treatment plans that were brought up and i think that was a different way of looking at it what was the most important thing to the patient what was it that they wanted to see happen? 
what can I do to help them fulfill that? And then is the patient willing to pay the price? If they're not willing to pay the price, whatever that is, time, money, a potential discomfort, and whatever, then we need to go back and look at the goals of the patient. Because I just told them, you know, this is, you told me this is what you want. This is what's in my toolbox related to knowledge, related to technology, whatever we can do. And this is what it's going to cost. Then the patient decides what they want to do. I think we give our best what we feel, what we know, not what we feel, what we know will last the longest for this patient so they don't have to have repeatable dentistry so often, people will have to have something redone. It's just the name of the game. Hell, we shed our skin every seven years. So if we're doing that, nothing that I'm going to place in the mouth. You know what's remarkable? I tell people, look, they say, well, this was X amount of dollars for this. I said, you're right. I can tell you that you could put a $100,000 Mercedes in your mouth and it wouldn't last two weeks from the constant pounding, changing the temperature, being bathed with acid. It wouldn't last two weeks, yet I'm putting this restoration in your mouth for a thousand bucks that may last 10 or 15 years. Tell me what's expensive. So when we can do something like that for a patient, whether we do it with CEREC, whether we do it direct, however we melt things in with implants, replacing body parts as we're doing intraorally now with implants. Just do it the most predictably way, the best for the patient, the way that you know you would want it done on yourself, and that will last the longest. We're uh, over our hour, but can, oh, I, ask sorry. You, can I ask you one overtime sure. question? Overtime. You know, we talk about uh, some things never First change. person that scores wins, right? <laughs> so I'm going to score with this one. Um, we were talking about that, uh, that Eckerberg change over 19 yes. years. One, one complaint that's never changed since they've been out is everyone graduates from dental school and they always whine about what they didn't learn in dental school. And so 6,000 of them just walked out of school two months yes. ago. And they're all complaining, I didn't learn any sleep apnea, I didn't do one snore guard, no Invisalign, no short-term ortho, uh, I didn't place one implant. And she wants to do everything, but... She can only, I mean, you can only walk up a stairway one step at a time. Um, what would, if, if you just walked out of dental school, like you're talking to a lot of people who just walked out of dental school, describe the first three steps you would take uh, on, on your journey. Walk up the stairway step by step of how to be. I, I think there's two part, and, and I have believed this for a really long time. I believe that dentistry is as much behavioral as it is clinical. So learn behavioral skills. Learn how to take care of people. Learn how from to... a man that can't get along with a cat. Oh no, I, I got <laughs> I just, the honorary <laughs> cat to sit with me before. But that was that was so profound. Dentistry. What would you say? Half behavioral, half clinical. It is. It is. Oh, so yeah. learn what's important to people, because and when we come in, what these six thousand people, I'm going to guess when they look in a mouth right away, what they see are crowns, implants, bridges, whatever. That, and they come up and they shoot a piece of paper across and it's got this ungodly sum of money on there and the patient flips out, right? However, the patient walks in and says, I want to look better, I want to chew better, I want to feel better. What can you do to me? So these are social aspects. But until you find out, Howard, from the patient what's important to me, what's important for them, there is no relevance. And we don't buy anything until it's relevant for us. I don't buy a car unless there's some relevant reason. I don't buy a house. I don't buy anything. I don't come here unless there's some relevance. You don't ask myself or uh, Samir Puri to come here unless there's some relevance for you to get accomplished. And I think that's what's forgotten. You know, we, we've been beaten over the head when we're in dental school. Get these units out. Get these units out. Get these units out. That's how everybody is graded to get out. And then all of a sudden they come out starting to deal with people. That's where the behavioral aspect comes in. So dive into some psychology. There's a lot of good books out there. I'm partial to systems theory. Just find out what's important to people. What's, then, what's the book on systems theory? Uh, Peter Sange has, uh, it's an old book. I, I you can forget what it is uh, out there right now. Margaret Wheatley has, uh, these are system theories, uh, even uh, family, theories uh system theories what do, you, what do you think would get them further if they got it uh, if they get a, get a behavior clinical if they got an a in one and a c in the other 
Which one would they get an A in to be more successful? I think right now behavioral. So do I. Because you can, you can, there's a lot of good education out you, there to get whenever clinical. Whenever you tell them any of that the stuff, they say they don't want to know fluff. They want to know what bonding agent you're using. That's, that's great. Uh, you can know all about the bonding agents, but unless you're putting it on a patient, you ain't making money, dude. I know. Okay, so you got to you got to have patience and in the chair. And here's the other thing: that, you know, they won't blink at buying an eighty thousand dollar laser, but you tell them to spend forty thousand on a consultant to come in and train their staff and teach them and all that, and they're like, no. Yeah. But they'll they'll, they'll you know they'll they'll buy a laser. Know like, know what's important for you. So those are your goals. That's what you're shooting for. Know what's important for your patients. And I really believe everything else. Well, hey, will take I want to tell of. you that um, again. Your your says member since two thousand one. That just means that's when Ken Scott actually I actually flipped the, the code. switch. Yeah. Um, but um, Dental Town would be nothing without um, guys like you who posted. I well, can't believe you posted ten thousand six hundred eight times. Um, more people have your name and their signature than any name on Dental Town. Oh, I mean, I, I I've never seen any other name. The checks in the mail, ladies and gentlemen. Just so you know. that deal. Yeah. Uh, friend of Flem. Um, it's an honor to know you thank you oh, for all well, thanks for everything for you've done howard starting it all oh, starting it all that was al gore I yeah god loving <laughs> okay thanks thank man. you so much